Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fifth series of uh, health seminars. Thank you for coming and thank you for all your presence during that uh, fortnight. And uh, um, welcome tonight also on the, uh, YouTube. That's uh, what we're going to have a live stream uh, for tonight, tomorrow, and after tomorrow. Thank you to be here, and I pray that God bless you, and I hope that you receive what you need for health and for the better life. Thank you again. And tonight, the topic will be on stress. So, um, Phil Brewer, he will present tonight, tomorrow and after tomorrow, uh, three topics about uh, mental health, uh, which we're going to start tonight with stress. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have and uh, come together and uh, know more about you, more about uh, lifestyle and uh, healthy style on this planet. Thank you for all the uh, information that you have for us and we looking forward that the Holy Spirit bless us and bless those who watch us online and uh, those who they are present in this place. I pray that the Holy Spirit fill our hearts and give us uh, strength and opportunities to understand your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And thank you to the New West Church for the invitation to come and speak to you from Silver Hills Guest House. Just for a moment, I want to tell you a little bit about Silver Hills. Uh, our guest house is about five hours drive, if you went as far as uh, the central Okanagan, that's where we're located. And we have a 12 guest room guest house and 90 acres where we take people on nature trails. Uh, we serve them a, uh, well, what, what should we say, a, a fabulous vegetarian meals. And we're built in, we, we build it around a spa setting. So it's like a spa, you have hot tub, steam room, infrared sauna, massages, Sheet wraps, we're gonna be showing you the sheet wrap here, here, here this, this evening. I wanna tell you a story, just to start off with, to give you what Silver Hills, like a little bit what it's all about. So we were walking home, uh, this would be about 25 years ago. We are walking to the guest house, and uh, a, a couple, a car pulled up, and there was three people in the car. And they were, they were German speakers, they couldn't speak very much English at all, and, and the, the man that was driving the car put his head out the window and he said, is this a place where we can stay? And you see we're on the side of a hill, way off uh, 17 miles, to, uh, 26 kilometers from Lumbee, in a tiny little community, we're just off by ourselves, and these people show up and they, is this a place to stay? And well, not really, this is, I mean, it's a guest house, we have people that stay for a period of time, but they said, well, we wanted to drive this road that goes from your place 40 kilometers through the forest out to Three Valley Gap. And I said, well, you can't do that tonight. This is a Saturday evening, you can't do it. So I said, come in the house, we'll phone a hotel for you back in Vernon, you can drive back to Vernon, and, and then come back in the, in the daylight and maybe drive that trail. So I said, just come in the house. Well, when they got in the house, I got on the phone and I started talking and talking and talking and talking and I forgot about them. I was talking to a fellow that was in New York City, a good friend, and I hadn't talked to him for a long time. And all of a sudden, I turned to them, I looked, oh, they've been there sitting there for 40 minutes waiting for me to get off the phone. Oh, I felt so embarrassed. I said to my wife, do we have room? And we said, we did. Why don't you spend the night? So they did. They spent the night. In the morning when they got up, I said, how long have you been in, in Canada? You're from Germany, how long have you been here? They said, we've been here six weeks. I said, well, what are you looking for? Are you looking to buy land? Or, I mean, six weeks is a long time to be here. Oh, they said, we've been looking for this place. Well, what would you think? You know, what would, I mean, what would, what would go through your mind? Like, what would you think? Uh, well, I said, well, if you're looking for this place, when is your flight? They said, well, not until Thursday. Well, so we had Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I said, stay. So they stayed. So there was father, mother, 19-year-old daughter. They stayed. At the end of their stay, they took off, and we thought we'd never see them again. Next spring, we got a phone call from them. We want to come back to Silver Hills. The husband, the mother and wife, mother and father. So they did. They came back. 
And when they walked in, they were visibly gained weight. They looked like they'd gained weight. I thought, what are you doing gaining weight? I mean, you know, they, they, you, I, could, I knew because we had massaged them during the time they were there, and they were, they were heavier. I said, what's going on? It's in my mind. And then they told me. The reason why they told me that they had, when they had, remember I, I told you, they said they were looking for this place. Well, I'll tell you why. When they had left Germany the year before and landed in Calgary, they had told their daughter they weren't going to smoke at all anymore. And they had not done it for six weeks. They'd snuck behind the car, behind the hotel, behind the tree. They were smoking here and there and everywhere. They were kept on there smoking. When they came to Silver Hills, they knew that they had come to the right spot. There was no smoking. And they quit smoking. And so the next year when they came back, yes, they had gained weight because that's typical of what people do. They gain weight after they quit smoking. So here they were. They spent the session with us. During the session, well, no, not, sorry. During the session, they said their daughter would like to come and spend some time with us. And I said, sure, let her come. So she came and spent nine months with us, stayed with us for nine months. Their daughter, while she was with us, she decided that she wanted to become baptized, she wanted to be baptized. And I asked her not to. I said, please, go home and see her. I loved her mother and father. I said, I would like you to go home and get baptized in Germany with your parents, because that's special. Well, the next time he came, he says, the Sabbath. He says, I can't believe this. Says, what do you get with the Sabbath? This doesn't make any sense. The Sabbath doesn't make any sense. I said to him, Uvi, I'm not, that's the father. I said, I'm not going to argue with you. That's not what we do at the guest house. We're there to, to help people with their health, not to argue with them over biblical things, right? I said, go home and read every German Bible you got and find out for yourself. The next year he came back, he'd been baptized. He says, I, I read every German Bible, every, every version of the Bible. He says, you're right. It's Sabbath is a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath. You can't argue with that. So now we have the, the mother and the father and the daughter are baptized. Amen. They came back at least eight times. Now I want to tell you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is this last month I've had their grandson in my house, a 23-year-old son, the, da the, the son of the daughter who was 19 when she came 25 years ago. I now have her son at my place, 23. He spent the last month with us at our home at, in the guest house. So anyway, I just got to tell you, it, it, it's exciting work, the kind of work we do. It's hard to explain, but it's absolutely enjoyable. I want us to take our Bibles this evening before we get started on the actual lecture, and I want us to read something in, in, in the Second Kings, the fifth chapter. And I, I love this story. This weekend, we're going we're gonna to spend some time. Tonight, we're going to talk to you about stress. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking to you about the call to medical missionary work. The, in the afternoon, we're going to be talking to you about digestion and nutrition and that kind of stuff. We're going to give you the home remedies you can use for that. On Sunday morning, we're going to be talking to you about um, uh, sinusitis and the home remedies you can use for, the, the simple home remedies you can use for that type of a, a situation, okay? But to start off with, this evening, let's take a, take a look at our Bibles, Second Kings, the fifth chapter. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. But what was he? But he was a what? A leper. Unclean. Everywhere he goes, you've got to say, unclean. You know, people have got to stay away. Leprosy, it was, it was the worst. This man is a tremendous leader. He's a, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's a, a man that is, is honored by everyone, honored by his, by his king. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. What does it mean to wait on Naaman's wife? What do you think that was all about? What are we talking about there? What, we, it comes, what comes to mind? If you're waiting on somebody, what does that mean? How, how do you do that? How do you wait on somebody? Any ideas? Well, I help them dress, right? Help them bathe, bring their food, spend time with them. But they don't want them to be lonely. I mean, there's, there's a whole process that you go through to, when you're waiting on somebody. And, and this is what this young lady, where, where had she come from? Where was this girl from? It says here that, and the Syrians had gone out and, on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. Where was she from? Israel. From the land of Israel. And what was she? A captive, right? She was a captive. She was taken from her mother and father's home. We're seeing all kinds of that taking place in our world today, aren't we? We're watching that taking place right now. Before our, This is not, what's happening now is not new. This has happened before. 
and she was taken captive. And I want you to see that and then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would do what? He would heal him of his leprosy. I want us to, I want, you know, like, I want you to think for a minute here this evening because this little story is so powerful. This girl was a captive. And what does she want to have happen for her master? That he gets what? Healing. Can you imagine? He wants her, she wants her master to get healing. I mean, if you were taken captive, you would be wanting the, your master to do what? Dry up and blow away. You want to get rid of him. You want to, are you with me? You see, this, how, this is, a, is a young lady who knew what she was here for. She knew what she was created for. She knew why she was on this planet. She understood what life was, what, the, what God's call was. It wasn't, to, you know, it's not what you think it is. You know, I, if I have everything, all my ducks in a row, we have this say, if I have my, all my ducks in a row, this girl did not have all of her ducks in a row, but she did. She knew why she was here. She knew what it meant to be a child of God. She understood that. You help the people you're with. Even if you're taken captive, you help your captors. Are you with me? Isn't that, isn't that what it is? Okay. Naaman, this is probably one of, the, one of the more humorous stories in the Bible. It says that Naaman went to uh, uh, the king of Israel with 10 talents of silver, 600 shekels of gold, 12 changes of clothing. He had to have a wagon and horses, and he had to have guards go with him. It was impossible to haul that much money with him, and he hauls it over to the king of Israel, and he says, make me well. What does the king of Israel say? Am I God that I can make you well? He must be wanting to pick a fight. He must be trying to make me, he wants, to, he wants me to tell, you know, do something crazy, and then he's going to come back with his whole army and take on Israel. And Elisha hears about it, and he says, he says come and send him up to my place. Is there a prophet in Israel? I want to ask you the question again. Is there a prophet in Israel? Think about it. I mean, this, there, 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 Elisha was a prophet. There was a prophet in Israel. Send him up to my place. We'll, we'll, we'll help him. And he comes up there, and what does Elisha tell him to do? You know the story? What did he say? Go do what? Wash seven times in the river. And what did Naaman say? What do you mean? I don't have any clean rivers at home? I mean, I, he's saying I'm not, I'm, I'm, I got leprosy. It's not that I didn't wash. I wash all the time. I'm, I'm not unclean. You know, you, know, you, you, you can think of the, 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 the uh, strife between nationalities. You know, you're an unclean person or you're an unclean, you know, we have that, that, that concept that goes on between all of us. You know, you, you're from a different country, so you're not, you know, we, we, should, we should put up barricades. What do you think, I'm unclean? What did his uh, servants, verse, I think it says 13, and his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some, something great, would you not have done it? You know, I want us to think about this. This, this is the key thought for this evening. If the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have done it? You know, when you, when you really want to take a look at what we're talking about, we're going to be spending some time talking about medical missionary work and talking about home remedies. And some people are going to say, well, I, I, every word here is understandable. There's no complicated scientific terms. You know, there's no some, something that is, you know. He said, I thought that the prophet would come out and, and proclaim the name of his God and clap his hands and make me well. <laughs> That's what he thought would happen. Something, I wanted a demonstration of something powerful. And that ended, his servant said to him, if the prophet had told you to do something great, you would have done it. But he only asked you to do something really simple. And sometimes it's the simple things that work. And we overlook them. We overlook them to our own destruction. We have a special calling. We have a prophet in Israel. There's still a prophet. And gave us, you know, the, this was before all of the complication. And the the simplicity is some of the things that work the best. And so I want us to think about it. We're going to spend some time talking about it. Well, stress. Pandemic stress. What do you think? Any stress for you guys? Any? I mean, you know, separation. Hardest thing in the world. I preached to a church. I won't even tell you the name of it. I preached to a church. 
There is 50, 55 people in the congregation, all wearing masks. I couldn't see one person's face. Most difficult sermon I've ever presented in my life. I couldn't read their faces. I couldn't read their countenances. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, when you're preaching, you want feedback. You want people. To look, you want to look at people that are alive. Are they awake? Are they listening? Are we getting through? Is it make sense? You want to know those things, right? And I, I couldn't get it. I mean, it was stressful. Stress. We run. Can you imagine inviting 20 people into your guest house? And there's. They're supposed to be six feet apart wearing a mask. And you ask them when they come, have you been in contact with this person, that person, this kind of thing? Have you washed your hands the last six times? You know, you have all this questionnaire you have to ask. And then they're sitting with their masks off, six feet from each other, eating with people they've never met. What if one of them has this thing? What if they're going to give it to each other? What is it going to be like if the health department comes here and you've got 20 people infected plus 12 staff? What are you going to, how are you going to explain? I mean, the stress, right? This last two years has been stressful. We can't travel. We can't get together with family. We can't have Christmas together. You know, it's been stressful. It's been very, very difficult. All right, what do we do about stress? Let's talk about it. I want to, I want to spend some time talking about it. First of all, the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. All right, let's think about it. The relationship that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Many of the diseases from which men and women suffer are the result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. What does? Grief, anxi anxiety, we've had that. Discontent, we've had that. Remorse, guilt, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite. You know, our idea of disease has changed. If you went back to the 1500s, I have a picture at home, a hospital in Paris in the 1500s. When I looked at this hospital, I looked at it, I went like, I've never seen anything like this. You know, you know what, you, when you, you, you look in the room and your expectation, well, I, of course, you want to see what it, how do they lay out the room in the 1500s. I mean, you know, like, I mean, they don't have the equipment, we don't have the, the you know, the, the bag with the, Dripped going into the we, we You know, they don't have the metal frame beds. I mean, what is it like? Well, you know what the first thing I see? They got two people in one bed. Two people in one bed. Well, I, I thought, of course, it's Paris, it's France. It's a stone building. It's cold. It's no central heating system. You go to the hospital, you're sick, and the other person is sick. You're cold. They put two people in bed to keep each other warm. That's all. I mean, that's it. This guy's got yellow fever. This guy's got tuberculosis. They get in bed together. What do you think happens? They both died. And that was really what happened in the 1500s when you went to the hospital. Chances of life were limited. In fact, as many people would kiss their relatives goodbye before they went to the hospital because chances of them coming out was very slim. In the next picture of that same group of pictures, the nurse is sewing up the dead body of one of the ones that has died on the floor in a shroud, in a sheet on the floor. She's sewing it up in the room with the other person still in bed. We haven't killed them yet. Let's wait. <laughs> it's like, you know, our idea of contagion, of germs, of viruses was non-existent. We thought that everything was, well, in fact, as they decorated the hospital with all kinds of figurines to scare away the evil influence, right? In fact, as we have a word, we, have a, we, have, we had a disease a couple of years ago. We haven't heard much about it. We used to have a thing we called the flu, remember? Which comes from what word? Influenza, which means straight across English, influence. I caught the influence. I, got the, I, got the, I, I caught the spirit. Are you with me? I caught the influence. That's, what, that's where the word comes from. And the next slide, the next, uh, slide I have. There was a fellow, his name in the 1600s, Dutch glass, he was making glasses. And he discovered that if you took two lenses and put them together in a certain way that you had a microscope. And he made a crude microscope and he did something that you wouldn't do. He scraped his teeth and he put it under his side in his microscope and he saw things that were running around. They were moving. He said, wow, there's something alive that we can't see with our eyes. It's, uh, they're, they're different shapes. They're, he was seeing bacteria, obviously. And he didn't want to call them animals. You know, you can imagine if he were grinding, he was excited, but he, if you were grinding glasses for people and you told them, I got animals in my mouth, 
You know, you may, they may not come back. So he called them amicals. But that was his first, that was our 1600s, first time we saw something that was microscopic. 1840, a doctor in, in, uh, in Europe discovered anthrax bacteria. And he took the anthrax, put it in a, in a, in a hypodermic needle, took sheep in before the College of Physicians and Surgeons, injected the sheep with the anthrax, the sheep dropped dead. And so he said, this is what's killing them. This is what's killing our sheep. It's this bacteria that's getting in the soil, builds up in the soil, and it kills the sheep. No, they wouldn't believe him. That's trick, trickery. Can't be. Can't be something that we can't see that would kill sheep. It's got to be something else. So he put out all kinds of, in those days, what they used is used pamphlets. He sent out all pamphlets all over Europe, and there was doctors from all over Europe that came to see what he was doing. What, you know, he had some anthrax in his window. He took the anthrax, injected it in sheep that some doctors came back by to see, and they didn't die. Sheep didn't die. And he thought, well, if, if they didn't die, I mean, it, 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 science has to be, science has to be, pure science has to be pure science. I mean, it, it, if it happens once, it has to happen each time. Why didn't they die? So he went and got some anthrax that he knew had killed other sheep, and he injected those sheep, and they still didn't die. Now he had a problem. He couldn't kill him with the anthrax that was in the window. He couldn't kill him with the anthrax that had killed other sheep. So that something had happened to the anthrax that was in the window. You know what had happened? The sunlight had killed the anthrax. And when he had injected dead anthrax into sheep, when he injected the live anthrax, they already had antibodies. He had developed a vaccine. That was our first vaccine. He had made a vaccine. Wow, success. Now we believe in the germ theory. That was 1840. Just think about it. 1940, 2040. We're not even talking about 200 years ago. We finally got the germ theory. Now we believe if somebody is sick, what do we do? We take them to the doctor. And we have them stick out their tongue. We take swabs. We take blood from their vein. We take a look at it. We want to find out what's in it, right? How many of you have ever seen a, a, a hip operation? They take the hip. They have the leg over the person's shoulder. They cut through the back of the leg. The doctor has got a, a, a completely shrouded head, right? He's got a mask on. It's, oxygen is coming from outside the room. He's got booties on. He's got a smock on. He's got a fatigues on. He's got double glove. Every square inch of his skin is covered. And he's working away for hours on that person, replacing their hip. He doesn't want to breathe into the wound, hepatitis, or some kind of undiagnosed disease. He has neither does he want the wound to breathe into him, something that is undiagnosed, and so he, we believe in the germ theory. We actually believe in it, totally. Except for there's a guy came along. He was, a, we, we're gonna say he's a Canadian. I love this, because he's a Canadian, because he didn't come from Canada. He wasn't born in Canada, but he, he naturalized, and so he's a Canadian. And anybody that's naturalized is a Canadian, and I like that, because Canadian, we have all kinds of diverse people from all over the world, and they bring their talent to Canada. That's fabulous. And he came to Canada. And he was sitting there and he was going, yeah, yeah, viruses and bacteria make us sick, but there's something else. He said, you know, some people are full of virus and they're not sick. And other people have a tiny bit of virus and they're just laid out flat. Why is that? And so he looked at it and you know what he found out? He says, I think it's stress. The first man that actually took the word that we would put on a bridge deck when it was overloaded, we called the, the beams under the bridge deck stressed. He took that and applied it to people. His name was Dr. Hans Selye. And he said, you know what? I think that if people have a lot of worry or stress, if they go through a pandemic and everything they try to do is kibosh, stop. You know, every time they try to have some kind of a family get together or do something, it's always wrecked, that that's stress. So he wanted to test it. He put animals in cages. Too many, too many in one cage. Bright lights, loud noises, whatever he could do to keep those, he would inject in their skin uh, stuff that would make them irritable so they couldn't sleep at night. Stress them. They started losing weight. They started losing hair. They started, they, their digestive tract started giving them troubles. They started, they, they, he took their blood and he saw their blood became more viscous. They had all the makings of heart disease. They had all the, the problems that would attend people that was degenerative illnesses. He said, I wonder if they have something in common. So he took a scalpel and took them apart. They had four things in common. 
One thing they had was their thymus shrank. Thymus is where the key tiller, key, T killer cells were developed. Part of your immune system was shrinking. Lymph nodes disappeared. Another part of your immune system disappeared. So it was affecting their immune system. How many of you can remember the first time you had stress? Anytime? Anybody remember? Remember the first? Oh, I can tell you. I can remind you. You were in an English class, and your English teacher said, you know what? We're going to do impromptu speeches. And she had a little basket, and she went around and handed to every one of you a topic, and you had to stand up in front of your classmates and give a five-minute or two-minute talk, having never had any research, never ever seen the topic before, you had to stand. And you thought, I'm going to be an idiot. I'm going to be embarrassed. And you immediately said, I have butterflies where? Where's the butterflies? In my stomach. Not in your elbow, not in your knee. Stress hits you right in the stomach. Okay? So there, indigestion. All of these animals had inflamed digestive tracts. And the last one, the one that's really difficult to even comprehend is that they all had enlarged adrenals. Enlarged adrenals. That's the go, go, go person. That's the person that never knows how to say no. See? Everybody, oh, I'll do that. Well, let's heap something else out of them. Well, I'll do that. Well, I'll do that. And then all of a sudden they can't do anything. Right? Adrenals. We call it adrenal exhaustion. Another word for it. Stress just took them down. Right? He called this stress. Okay, what, well, let me read this story. Here we go. I'll give you a couple thoughts to add to that. On a Saturday night, 18-year-old Donna Cole told me that she'd been vomiting and suffering from severe abdominal cramps and diarrhea for five days. So this lady is how old? 18-year-old Donna Cole. She's vomiting, suffering from abdominal cramps and diarrhea for five days. Her trouble had begun just an hour after she left the dentist office. The dentist had told this pretty popular girl she must have all of her teeth pulled and fitted with false ones. Result, a tempest in her emotional center. Nerve impulses from this center quickly initiated and perpetrated vomiting and severe cramps and diarrhea. Donna was greatly surprised when I told her the cause of her trouble was not in her abdomen. What was the problem? Well, she's 18 years old. She has to have all of her teeth pulled, fitted with false ones. Can you imagine if she's playing volleyball and her teeth fly out, flew out? That's it. Her dating game is over. Her life is finished. She's done, right? I mean, it's, it's catastrophic. And her body's responding to the thought, even unannounced to her own mind. Even unannounced. You see what I'm saying? She wasn't even concentrating on this. She couldn't even, why am I, what, what's going on, right? what her thoughts were doing. I, I'm going to read you this one. You, this has never happened to anybody in this room, but I, or online, whatever. But I'm going to read you this. I want you to think about it. Doctor, I came to you because I'm all tuckered out. Before this thing hit me, I could work all day and not be tired. Now when I start across the field on the tractor, I get so weak that I have to stop before I get halfway across. I have to get off the tractor and lie down by the fence before I have strength to go on. It's not like me. For the past month, I've been completely bushed. I've been losing weight too. Stole, story was told by a husky farmer and his 20s, who was never sick but unable to work. What do you think it was? Severe anemia, leukemia, internal bleeding, cancer, tuberculosis. Physical examinations and lab tests revealed nothing. What did he have? Then the man told his story. His attractive fiance was doing a little dating with another fellow. A car he wanted to buy was just put up in price and seemed out of reach. Loss of the car and possible loss of the girl were taking their toll. Which one do you think he was more worried about? The car or the girl? What's that? The girl. You make points for saying that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. But anyway, either regardless, losing either one of them was causing him stress, right? And stress was affecting him, weakness and strength. What's the most stressful job you think there is in the world? Most stressful job. Air traffic controllers. If you took air traffic controllers and matched them weight for weight, age for age, family size for family size, if you matched them every way possible, uh, a uh, air traffic controller has five times the incidence of high blood pressure of any comparable group. Five times the incidence. Having a group of people in an air in a, in a jet flying over top of an airport and you have the responsibility to get them down safely. Bad weather, less gas in the, in the plane, somebody's sick on the plane has to be taken down right away, somebody's having a, some kind of allergic reaction up in that plane, they gotta get them down right away and he's gotta try and jockey around and get the, the, you know, the airfield cleared and maybe there's, like they had in Calgary, 
two days ago, they had a tremendous snowstorm and they got to get it all plowed off and they got people in the, in the plane that they can't get them down, they can't land them, the ice is building up on the wings. Stress, five times the incidence of high blood. When, when you get under stress, what happens? Blood pressure goes up. Take away the stress, what happens? Blood pressure goes down. Put a person under stress, blood pressure goes up. Take away the stress, what happens? Blood pressure goes down. Put a person under stress, blood pressure goes up. Keep them under stress, blood pressure stays up. Keep them under stress, blood pressure stays up. Keep them under stress, blood pressure stays up. Then what? Take away the stress, new normal. High blood pressure. Well, what can you do for them? I mean, we're gonna get into some home remedies, but before we do that, I wanna ask, what, what could you do if a person had, came to you and said, I have high blood pressure. You know it's a stressful thing. What could you do for them? Well, let's think about it. They, what, one of the things they prescribe is what's called a beta blocker. Do you know what a beta blocker does? What happens is there's an enzyme in your blood that is absorbed into the wall of the arteries, which helps it constrict, make it get smaller, get tighter, right, which puts up the pressure. So they made a chemical that mimics that enzyme that docks on the very spot in the cells that line the artery that actually mimics it so that they dock there and they and the enzyme can't dock there, so it leaves the blood vessels so that they don't constrict, right? Leaves them open, leaves them more relaxed, and so you don't, it keeps the blood pressure down. Well, if you put that person in a neutral tub, see, just take neutral water, it's not hot, it's not cold, and I, I gave you, a, or there, you'll be having, or you have a handout in there, there's a, I think it's called a neutral tub bath. You put a person in a neutral tub, it's not hot, it's not cold, it's body temperature, and you have them lay there for 45 minutes to an hour. Just lay there. What happens? Well, the same thing that you would do with the beta blocker. What it happens is it relaxes all the muscles and all the blood vessels. And the person's just laying in the tub for 45 minutes to an hour, and it relieves this constriction that takes place in the blood vessels. It takes about two weeks of doing that every night. So you, we're, we're gonna do this with a person. I've had people do it. I've had, them, I've had them where their blood pressure came down by doing this every night for an hour, lay in a, a tub of neutral water and let their body just totally relax. You take a book, read it, do whatever you want. Just lay there and calmly and quietly, right? And the blood pressure can come down. Now there's another thing you can look up on, your, on the internet called Respirate. Respirate, it's a, a website where they actually will sell you a device that you can, it helps you to do deep breathing. So you deep breathe, but it helps you to breathe in tune with your heart. So it's hooked up so you can, your heart, as your heart's working. I, I don't know if some of you have ever gone out exercising and it feels like you got your second wind. All of a sudden I could just walk and walk and walk. And just, oh, I don't know what happened, but I just, I have so much energy. I don't know why I'd never had this before. Now all, all of a sudden I could just walk. What's happened is your heart and your lungs are working together. And that's what they're doing with Respirate. I think that they guarantee a, a 10, per, 10 point drop in your systolic blood pressure with using their method. Well, you could do deep breathing. We teach deep breathing at Silver Hills. We'll be talking to you more about this, I think on Sunday morning. But you can, do, you can also do deep breathing. You breathe in through your nose, hold your breath. I'll, I'll talk to you more at the end of the, of the session, but you can do deep breathing as well. So, you can help to bring that person's blood pressure down by using some of those methods. I, you know, I like doctors that, that, um, that are research doctors. I mean, all doctors are, have, have a value, but specifically doctors that are researchers. And so there was a doctor who was a cardiologist. And you know, he, he said, well, I don't know. There's, there's, more to, there's more to heart disease than just fat. You know, sometimes people say, well, you just eat too much fat. Well, yeah, maybe. But there's other things to heart disease other than just too much fat. And, and so what he did is he said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some experimenting. Well, he sent off his chairs to get them upholstered. And when they came back, his upholsterer said, what kind of business do you run? He says, well, I'm a cardiologist. I look after heart patients. Well, he says, your patients are weird. He says, what do you mean my patients are weird? Well, he says, the only part of the chair that's worn out is the leading edge. So these people, when they come to the doctor's office, they never sit back in the chair, put their arms on the armrests and relax. They always sit on the edge of their chair. So when they get to the doctor's office, the, the appointment's for nine o'clock, but 
you know, a doctor never shows up at nine. He's, he, he, you're, if, you're, if you're going in at nine, if you get in at 10, you should be happy, right? I mean, it's, it's just the way, the nature of, the, of the, the type of thing. So they're sitting on the edge of their chair and they're going what? At, at nine o'clock, he isn't coming at 9.15. By 9.20, they're looking at their watch and say, I don't have all day. I can't sit here all day. I got too many things to do. I can't sit here. I got, I got to get out of here. They're sitting on the edge of their chair. So he thought, okay, that's, that's an interesting thing. So then he sent to each one of his heart patients, whenever they, not the patients, but whenever a, one of his patients had an event to their coworkers and family members, he sent a, a questionnaire, what was Joe doing just before the event? Oh, he's eating burgers and fries and milkshakes and just awful. 10 burgers every night. No, he didn't find that. You know what he found out? Joe was doing more and more things in less and less time. Joe would never relax. He was just go, 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 go. We used to say to him, come on, come and play volleyball, come to the lake, come and sit by the lake, come and sit by the fire. Oh, I got to get a few things done. I got to get this done. I got to get that done. I got a whole list of things. He's always busy, 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 busy. He called it time urgency. Time urgency. His, his problem was time. His life was just not enough time. If I only had more time, time is just, I don't have enough time. Okay, well, time urgency. He said, if you have a high fat diet, so a high fat diet, that gives you a high risk for heart disease. But if you have a high fat diet plus time urgency, you multiply that risk times seven to equal your risk. If you have a low fat diet, plus time urgency. You multiply that times seven to equal your risk. So whether you have a high fat diet or a low fat diet, whatever the risk is for that, you multiply it times seven if you've got time urgency. Well, how do you know if you've got time urgency? Well, that's a good question. How would you know? Well, let me ask you a question. What's the best time to go to the bank so you don't have to wait to get in? What's the best time to go to the bank? You don't want to stand in line up. What's the best time to go? Go first thing in the morning, right? Go, go before everybody else. Go there in the morning. Or some people tell me just before lunch. Go in there just before lunch, before the r lunch rush. Just, you know, 11.30. If you have time urgency and you walk in the bank and you pick the best time early in the morning, you walk in the bank and there's 10 people in front of you, what would this person with time urgency do? What would you think they'd do? They'd go over to the manager and say, can't you see the lineup? Put another teller on. I can't stand here all day, right? I don't have what? What's the problem? Time. I don't have time. Time urgency. Have you ever been in a traffic? I was just in a traffic jam coming in. Chilliwack this way. They got two lanes. And when they finally open it up at, 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 at 200 Street, it just, boom, there's no, you just take right off again. But until you get there, it's 15, 20 minutes just to go a little ways. Stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. If you have time urgency and you're in a traffic jam, what do you do? Oh, just sit back and play the radio. No, if you are a time urgent person, you go down the soft shoulder, you're going whipping down to the first cutoff, you go out on the first exit, you're going down side streets, knocking over garbage cans, killing stray cats. I gotta get there, I don't have time, right? If you're doing dishes, person that has time urgency, what do they do? They look at the clock. When they do anything, they look at the clock. I got seven minutes. I can whip through this pile of dishes in seven minutes. And they start churning through the dishes. And they get the dishes done. While they're doing the dishes, the phone rings. What do you think they do? Oh, well, they sit down and put their legs up. No, they put the phone right here and get the dishes done in six and a half minutes and carry on the conversation. That's a person of time urgency. Let me read you a story. This is a person about time, that has time urgency. Here we go. Oh, let's see if I got it. Here we are. Okay. There's a story of a motorist who was driving along a lonely country road late one night when he discovered that one of his tires had gone flat. When, when he opened his trunk to pull out his spare, he found to his horror he didn't have his jack. What to do? It was farm country, so homes were few and far between, but there had to be one somewhere down the road. He didn't want to sit in his car all night, so he started trudging off into the darkness in the direction of what he hoped would be the closest farmhouse. As he tramped wearily along, he began to think of that farmer down the road and how he would react upon hearing a knock on his door at midnight. Awakened from a sound sleep, he would wonder who on earth could be at that awful hour. Why would a person bother him, bother him when he had to be up so early in the morning to milk the cows? There would come another knock, and grouchily the farmer would decide he'd better get up. Whoever was getting him out of bed had better have a good reason. Thus, as the stranded motors trudged along, he began to get more and more uptight as he imagined an upset farmer 
jerking up the window and testily demanding what he wanted. So thoroughly did he fantasize the farmer's exasperation and willingness to help that by the time he arrived at the farmhouse, he became indignant at the imagined response. So when the window did indeed go up at a second knock and the farmer appeared asking what he wanted, he responded angrily, you can keep your old jack. Uh, you can see how, I mean, I've done a, a fair amount of lecturing and I have people come up to me at the end of the lecture and they will introduce themselves with this comment. I know you don't have time, but, well, so how do you know I don't have time? <laughs> but you see, see, if we have time urgency, everything we think of is in terms of time, right? We don't want to get, we don't want, we don't want to bother the farmer because he's got, he's got to be up in the morning to milk the cows. So his time is valuable to him, but my time is valuable to me, and I don't want to bother people with their time is so valuable to them. Let me read you a story of a person that doesn't have time urgency, not, none of it at all. The story of a man who was on his way home from the market with a sling's stick slung over his shoulder at the end of which was tied a bottle of soy sauce. He's coming home from shopping. He's got a bottle of soy sauce tied at the end of his stick. As he's walked along, he suddenly felt the lessening of weight at the end of the stick. Then came the sound of a crash and the shattering of glass and the cobblestones. He kept right on going. At that, a passerby called after him, old man, don't you know you broke your bottle of soy sauce on the street? Without slackening pace or looking behind, the old man responded, what will I gain by stopping? Don't you wish you were that relaxed? <laughs> yeah, if, it, if, it's, if it's a freeway and it's blocked, you just play the radio and just sit back. Well, I guess I'll have to do that job tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, I can't get all keyed up about it, right? Okay, well, at Silver Hills, we have a problem, uh, not very often, but once in a while. You know what we have? We have bears. Only usually in the fall do they ever come by and they're looking for fruit. And because we know that, well, we pick the fruit so that they don't hang around. But I want us to think about it here this evening. Supposing while we're here chatting, we're, we're in New West, so it's unlikely this could happen. But supposing we were at Silver Hills and somebody heard the scratching at the door, they thought it was a dog, and they went and opened the door and in walked a great big black bear. What would you do? If a big bear walked in here right now, what would you do? Scream? Okay, we got somebody's going to scream. Anybody else? What are you going to do? Anybody going to run? Somebody, somebody's going to run. I mean, there's lots of room. Let's run out of the way. Like, he stays there, we go there, right? We're going to get out of here. And, and it actually, if you meet a bear in the bush, you know what you're supposed to do? Anybody know? You're supposed to do this. You see, make yourself as look as big as you possibly can. He doesn't want to attack something this big, right? You don't want to run. If you want to run, then he can tell how big you are and where, which way you're going. So you just kind of stand still and put your hands up. Now, it's easy enough to say, right? We had a fellow, I want to tell you about this, because we had a fellow down the road, and he had, he was a, he was a fellow that, he was a, a collector. He collected everything. He collected, he collected everything you can imagine. He had gone to every country, and so he had teak wood, and he had brass, and he had, he had, uh, ceremonial masks and spears and ivory and you name it, he had everything that you, from, I mean, it was like going into a museum. His house caught fire. Now he had a pond of water in front of his house. It was all the length of this church away from the house. And he had a pail in his hand and he would run towards the water and then he would think of something in the house that was too good, too valuable to leave and he'd run back towards the house and he'd see how big the flame was, and then he'd run back to get water, and then he'd think of something else that was in the house, and he'd run back and forth, back and forth, back. The house was burnt to the ground, gone, done, finished, smoldering, when we arrived, and he was still running back and forth and didn't have a drop of water in his bucket. That's stress. That is what stress is. See, the cognitive faculty of your brain shuts off when you get under stress. Yeah, the, the part of your brain where you take a thought and you add another thought to it, make another thought, make it, and make a plan. It doesn't exist. When you see a bear, you don't sit there and think, well, let's see, what's the best way out of here? You're gone. <laughs> You're, you crawl over the person beside you, you knock them over, you knock over the expensive uh, photography equipment, you just knock it flying, it doesn't make a bit of difference, nothing is important but your life and your cognitive faculty's gone. There's some physiological things that happen when you get under stress, right? your pupils dilate. I mean, if you're gonna get eaten, you wanna have a good look at the guy that's eating you, right? You wanna have a very good look. So your pupils dilate, they get big, right? 
your, your saliva dries up. Your mouth goes dry. You do not digest food well when you're under stress. That's your digestive, your stomach becomes inflamed. I mean, you, 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 don't, want to, you don't want to put effort into digesting food when you're going to be eaten. There's no sense becoming, eating and digesting a meal when you're going to become a meal. You know, it's just a, it, your body doesn't work that way. You're, if you have a flu, we had a lady that came here to the guest house. She had a flu. She had had it for four months. Four months. You say to yourself, why? Why would that happen? The day she got the flu, she found out her husband wasn't being faithful to her. Four months she had that flu. Are you with me? That's stress. See, that's what stress does. Knocks out your immune system. Just boom, right? Stress is really hard on your immune system. Okay. What else happens? Well, the blood. Now, this is really important because we're going to show you a treatment here to counteract stress. But the blood goes from the surface of your skin to your core. I want you to think of this. Now, if a person has predominantly cold feet, one of the causes, not the only, but one of the causes can be that they're under continuous stress. You with me? Because the blood goes from the surface of your skin to your core, and it, your extremities doesn't get there, right? So hands and feet are cold, especially feet. So that's, now you can understand that person could be under chronic stress. Are you with me? All right. So what do we say? Breathing becomes shallow and rapid. Heart rate goes up. Saliva stops. Digestion stops. Blood goes from your skin to your core. What else happens? Your adrenals start pumping out adrenaline. Okay? Remember I told you that when those, those animals got under stress, Dr. Sully stressed them that their adrenals started pumping out adrenaline. They had this tremendous amount of adrenaline. Energy to go burn, right? All right. These are the effects of stress. What can we do about stress? Help me out. You're my class. Teach me. Tell me what you do. Under stress, what would you do? What would be, what would be something you, what would be a really valuable thing you could do about stress? Just dealing with it right away. What's that? Take time out. Take time out. Okay, good. All right. Well, all right. Try and work out the most, try and think about the most worsome, you know, reasonable way to work it out. Let's talk it over with the bear. All right, now I want you to think about this. I've had some of my guests come to me and tell me my boss is a bear. What does that mean? My boss is a bear. What does that mean? When they are sitting in their desk and they hear the footstep of their boss walking down the hall, what's happening? Blood pressure is going up. Heart rate is going quicker. Digestion is stopping. Blood's going from this. All of those things. That's what that person saying. Their boss is a bear. What would you tell somebody? I had a university professor come to Silverhills. As a university professor, you have to publish a paper twice a year that's, a, that's peer reviewed. It has to go into a, a journal. It has to be published in a journal. That's part of your tenure as being a professor. You have to constantly publish, 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 publish. When she would write an article and present it to her dean, he would throw it on the floor, not hand it back to her. He'd say, that's rubbish. What would you do? What would you say to that lady? What should she do? I asked her, do you need that job? How badly do you need that job? Obviously, she's not going to change him. So you're going to have to work out. Your, you have to think of a way to work it out. Some of us don't have a professor like that. Our, our boss is not a bear. We carry our little bear with us. You know what that little bear is saying? Don't stop. Don't sit down. Don't rest. Don't take a break. Remember I told you that person had a time urgency? That, that person has their little bear with them everywhere they go. It, it, every time they stop for two seconds, they start to settle, they have this thing in their head, get something done. You're wasting time. Get busy. Do something. You're just, you know, you're sitting around. You're wasting it. You see what I'm saying? All right. So what, what, what are we going to do about stress? Help me out. What's some of the physiological things we can do about stress? Okay, let me read you this. Here we go. I got something. I got a couple things. Laura G. had been feeling... Depressed, lonely, and blah. So a psychiatrist suggests you try the antidepressant Prozac. After months of sessions of no luck with the wonder drug, she turned to another psychotherapist, Ozzy, Ozzy Gutang. Therapy sessions were scheduled at sunrise. Almost miraculously, Laura's moods, moods brightened. Her lethargy went away. What caused Laura to feel so much better? The catalyst wasn't a, dr a drug or talking about her childhood. The cure was, help me out. What was the cure? 
walking. Let me read that again. It says, the catalyst wasn't drug or talking about her childhood. The cure was walking. Surprisingly, Laura's psychological experience isn't that, physiological experience isn't that far out. There's convincing clinical evidence that regular exercise improves self-esteem, reduces anxiety and hostility, and can even lift clinical depression. Now, Dr. Hans Selye, the man with the animals in the cages, in some cages he put an exercise wheel. And in those cages, guess what he said? There was no disease manifestations. How much? Not 90% less, not 80% less, not 70% plus. There was no disease. He said this, exercise neutralizes stress. Here we are in a pandemic. We've had stress, stress, stress. How are we going to neutralize it? Remember, remember I, I read you this story where these, when Naaman uh, went to see the prophet in Israel, Elisha, and he told him to go and baptize in the river seven times. Well, that, I'm not, you know, that doesn't make sense. Give me something. Come on, clap your hands and raise, you know, do something. Ex Dr. Hansel, he said, exercise neutralizes stress. Regular walking neutralizes stress. The prophet in Israel said it this way, walking in all cases where possible is the best remedy for diseased bodies. And that's something? Dr. Hans Selye, you know, he was doing this fabulous research study. I mean, he was the man that coined the word stress. He said, what? Exercise neutralizes stress. The prophet in Israel said, walking in all cases where possible is the best remedy for diseased bodies. Not because it cures the disease, because it gets rid of the stress that the disease is causing. You with me? That's, that's the, it, it's the foundation. It's the fundamental. Let me show you how it works. Here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk over here for a second. So here we have it. We're going to draw a neuron. This is a brain nerve, right? And another one. So here we have, when we have a, if, you know, if you wanted the nerve, if you wanted a cell to be responsive, to be the most responsive cell in the body, what you would need is to have the surface area of it enlarged, because it's on the surface where the response takes place. And so what the designer did is he took the cell and he stretched it out as long as he could. That's a, that's a nerve. See, so stretch it out as long as you can. And so then all of a sudden it, the surface becomes very reactive because that's what happens. So the dendrite, that's what picks up the, the impulse. And then because it's a, mostly a surface now, the impulse travels right along the, the surface of the, of the nerve till it gets to this spot. And this is what we call a synapse or synaptic joint. And that if it has in it neurotransmitters, right, if it has neurotransmitters in that synaptic joint, then the message carries on and travels to the next nerve and passes the message along. If the neurotransmitters are not there, and there's, there's a depleted amount of them, the person's been under stress, 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 doesn't have the chemistry here, the message dies, it stops right there. There's a substance we can use that will make that happen. What do you think it is? It's called alcohol. So what alcohol does is it stops the message from carrying on. It blocks it right here. Well, that's kind of fun in a way. I mean, at first you think, oh, that's terrible. Well, but if you're an uptight person and you're having a hard time socializing with other people and you have a couple of drinks and that part of your brain that is making you nervous and tense and, and not able to socialize, it, the message, that doesn't get through. So there you get giddy and you start laughing and being silly and and having fun and everything like that, well, that's, you know, you go like, wow, it's just wonderful to have a few drinks. You get in your car and you're driving down the road and a cat runs in front of the car and you go to hit your brake, but you hit your gas pedal and sit and you run over the cat. Because you, the message is not getting through. You see, it's the same idea. So not getting the message through might make you more sociable, might also make you run over a small child or have a serious car accident. You see what I'm saying? All right. If the neurotransmitter is not there, I liken it to this. Uh, I, those of us who are children and those who have had children, we have always given chores like washing the dishes. And you know yourself, if a child does not want to wash a set of dishes, they can make that set of dishes last for an hour. And they can sit there with a cloth 
and they just go around that dish so slowly that you could almost give them a shake, like, get that job done, you know, be so, but he doesn't want to do this, so he's just really working it, he's really working it. And if mom walks into the kitchen, and she says, as soon as you get the dishes done, we're going to the lake, what happens? The wishes dishes don't even get dipped, they hardly even get wet, they're just on the tray, we're ready to go. That's when you got neurotransmitters. When the dishes where the kid doesn't want to do them, those transmitters are not getting through. You see what I'm saying? So if the neurotransmitters are there, things are working. Guess what? Exercise makes the brain produce more neurotransmitters. What we have done, if you were to take the axle and you were to look at the end of it, we're going to take this part of it right here and we're going to look at the end of it. Very similarly, what I explained to you that happens with the artery walls those neurotransmitters, once they're released into the, act, into the synaptic joint, immediately after that, they dock right on here. See, they fit these spaces. They dock right back on here, and they fill them back up again. Well, we came up with what's called an SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. It docks there instead, and that's what we call things like Prozac or Celexa. These things will actually dock on the axome, and they will, they will prevent the neurotransmitters from leaving the joint, which gives the possibility of the joint car uh, carrying on. So here we got two methods. One prevents the reuptake. The other one, exercise, makes you make more neurotransmitters. See the difference? All right, now here's the problem, because it takes at least five weeks, three to five weeks of regular exercise to lift the clinical depression, and to produce enough neurotransmitters. And if a person's depressed, the problem with depression is they won't do anything. They can't get out of bed. They don't feel like it. They get an idea. I want to. Okay, today's the day. I'm going to get up. And they get out of bed. They wash their face and say, "Well, maybe tomorrow," because they lack the neurotransmitters. You see, see why we have lifestyle centers? We bring them to our, and we take them walking every day. You know, take them because. Every day, every day, every day, to get them into it because they, they actually need to be helped to do it many times. If you've got a friend that's suffering with depression, or you yourself, you need to have a buddy. You need to have somebody else keep you responsible. You've got to keep that rate. You will not get the response of the neurotransmitters for three to five weeks. But after three to five weeks, you've got the neurotransmitters, and you're not blocking them. You see what now, let me tell you, here's a side effect. Now, when we first started Silver Hills, we were largely a... Um, a cancer clinic. Well, the first guest we had was had cancer, and then she told two others, and they had cancer. And then they, so when we first started, we had a lot, lot of cancer patients that came. And I was reading everything I could possibly read on cancer that I could, we could do to help these people, right? And I re remember reading one, one spot where it said if you should have your clients or your, the person that's come to your guests lay under a tree and visualize your white blood cells are eating uh, like Pac-Man are eating cancer cells. That's when you visualize that. Uh, nah, I, I can't go with that. I, 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 mean, I, I think there's some good things, but that, maybe I don't go with that. Well, there's a fellow called Norman Cousins. Norman Cousins wrote the book of Anatomy of an Illness, but he also wrote another book called Head First. And what he basically did in that book is he, he went to every person that had cancer that lived, outlived the prediction, and he, and he quizzed them. He asked them what they did. What, how did you think? All that kind of stuff. And, and because of his research, he was asked to sit on UCLA's medical board, and they were studying the, the relationship between the mind and the body. Remember what I read to you at the very beginning? The, the relationship between the mind and the body is very intimate. And so that UCLA was studying this neuro... Let me get it right. Neuro... Physiology. Anyway, they were, they were studying the relationship between the mind and the body. Here's what they discovered. If you have excess neurotransmitters, they will dock on your white blood cells and make them into super cops. I want you to think about this for a minute now, okay? Let's just think about what we're actually talking about here. We're saying that exercise increases your neurotransmitters. UCLA's medical board said that if you have an excess of neuro transmitters, they will dock on your immune system, your white blood cells, and make them into super cops. 
Now you got to ask yourself the question, what, is the, what way would you go about doing this, what we're talking about here? We've got a person that's stressed, 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 stressed. I just feel like I'm wiped out. I have no energy. I have no desire to do anything. I don't even have an appetite. That person, you would say, well, let's go walking. Let's get you into a walking program. It takes us three to five weeks of regular exercise to lift the clinical depression. That's what, that's what Keith Josgard discovered. Prophet in Israel said, walking in all cases where possible is the best remedy for diseased bodies. Not because it makes them slim, but because it makes their brain get the chemistry it needs to be able to think positively again. Are you with me? It, gets, it also gives their white blood cells, it docks on their white blood cells and makes them into super cops. See, you see, you see what we talk about you know, he said, bathe in the river seven times. That's stupid. I'm clean enough, right? It's the simple things. If he had told you to do something difficult, would you have done it? You see what I'm saying? Okay, that's, that's one thing. So what else can we do? So one thing we can do is exercise. Oh, let me give you one thing. Oh, this is fabulous. Dr. Hans Selye said that you can put deposits in your stress bank. All right, so you're, when I was going to school, I went to school in Pennsylvania during the Vietnam War. And the school that I went to was preparing us to be medics. And so they would put us in green fatigues and, and army boots and we would march and we would, we would push up. So we did all this pre preparation. To, we were actually gonna go to war. They were preparing us because we would have got conscripted after we graduated. One of the things I could never figure out is how much they wanted to just do push-ups, 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 push-ups. Why, 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 why? If you're in a war zone and a bullet hits you, you do not hear the discharge from the gun. Are you with me? When the guy pulls the trigger and that bullet hits you, the bullet hits you before the sound gets to you. You don't even know where it came from. So why would you make the person be physically fit? They're not going to outrun the bullet. Why? What's, the per what's the point of being physically fit? Well, you know why? Because what Dr. Hans Selye said, exercise puts deposits in your stress bank. When you're in a war zone, you're under stress, and your sergeant says, stand still, and everything in you wants to run. <laughs> if you run, you become a, a target immediately. We, you're wearing green fatigue, so you blend in with the forest, right? So they can't see you. And as soon as you run, they, oh, there he is, bang. <laughs> he says, stand still, right? Handle the stress. Physical fitness prepares your body to handle stress. Are you with me? <coughs> okay. What else can we do? You know, if you went to a play called Bard on the Beach, Shakespeare on the Beach, what are the actors and actresses doing? Behind the curtain, what are they doing? You know what they're doing? They're going... Why? You know why? Deep breathing calms and tranquilizes the mind. Are you with me? Calms and tranquil. When you get under stress, what's one of the first things that happens? You get shallow, rapid breathing. As soon as you start deep breathing, what's going to happen? You're going to get oxygenated. And that oxygenation is going to calm the mind. Okay, so you wake up 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, <coughs> wide awake. Oh boy, here I am, wide awake again. Great time, open offshore accounts, right? <coughs> Great time solving problems at work, solving problems of traffic problems. I got I to gotta get up earlier and get, get out the door earlier. I gotta, you, know, I gotta, you start doing problem solving, 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. About half an hour later, what happens? If I don't go back to sleep, I'm going to be a wreck. Have you ever told yourself to go to sleep and then you went to sleep? It doesn't happen that way. If you, if you can't go to sleep and you tell yourself to go to sleep, you just don't go to sleep because you told yourself to go to sleep, do you? The fact is, sometimes that even wakes you up. Well, I think I'll get a, go get a drink. That'll help. You get up. As soon as you get out of bed, you're done. You're finished. You get a drink. Now I have to go pee. And then on and on it goes. And pretty soon, like... I've had it. I can't get back. I'm never going to get to sleep now. And we'll tell ourselves that. I'm never going to get to sleep. I'm going to be a total wreck. I'll, I'll drive off the road where I'm going to work. I'll probably crash into a tree. What can you do? 
All right, I want you to help me. You breathe in through your nose, you count to 20, you purse your lips and blow it all out. Breathe in through your nose, count to 20, purse your lips, blow it all out. I went to Uchi Pines in Alabama to learn from Dr. Thrash. And I was so excited to sit at the feet of a doctor that was giving me terminology, triglycerides, HDL, LDL, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood Oh, wow, I'm learning all the medical terms. Then one afternoon, she's going to teach us how to do deep breathing. Boring. Why would I ever need that? Boring. Came back to Silver Hills. <laughs> now we're going we're, <coughs> we're to try and run a lifestyle center. Well, we have to form a committee. You can't do this alone. You need a committee. So we have a committee meeting. What do you discuss on committee meetings? What, do you, what, do you, what, what is committees all about? What do they do? They discuss what? Problems. That's what they do. I go to the committee meeting, and every person in the room brought in five problems I'd never heard about. Now I went home with 25 problems. I had only two when I went there. I got 25. I came home. I can't go to sleep. I'm, we're working 14 hours a day. I'm laying in bed. I can't sleep. Here I am. I'm, oh, man. My wife has gone to sleep. I can't go to sleep. So one night I just stood up. As soon as I stood up, what do you think happened? She woke up and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I can't sleep. I thought if I stood up long enough, maybe I'd just fall into bed. She said, are you going to jump? I, well, I'm sitting on the second floor. I mean, if I jump, I'd only break, maybe I'd hurt my leg. I'm not, I mean, I can't. I'd have to get on the roof to kill myself and jump off head first. So I could see she was, I said, I got back in bed, right? But you know what happened? As soon as I got back in bed, she went back to sleep. But I can't go to sleep now, and I can't even get out of bed. And I remember what Dr. Thrash said. She said, breathe in through your nose. Hold it for the count of 20. Purse your lips, blow it all out. Breathe in through your nose, hold it for a count of 20. Purse your lips, blow it all out. So here I am laying beside my wife. And I have to admit to you, I made a few squeaks and rattles with my breathing that I thought would wake up the kids next door, let alone my wife. But I brought, started in through your nose, count to 20, purse your lips, blow it all out. Okay, so I started getting this thing going. Now she said, do it 30 times. How do you keep track of 30 breaths? Well, I use my fingers, right? So I go through 10. Then I started worrying, how am I going to know that I've gone through three tens? Like I got to do one 10, then I do the next 10. And when I got to 12, guess what happened? I went to sleep. Now, let's do it together. I want us to do it this evening. Here we go. I'm going to do the counting. You don't have to worry about the counting. Let's do the, I'll, I'll do the counting. So into your nose. Hold. Purse your lips and blow it all out. In. Hold. Purse your lips and blow it all out. In. Hold. Purse your lips and blow it all out. Okay, just breathe normally. First lesson. The most important part of deep breathing is guess what? The breathing out. Blow it all out. Purse your lips. What does it mean to purse your lips? Well, it's like when taking your money out of your purse. You do it, you want, your, you want it tight, right? Tighten up. Blow it. The reason why you tighten up this, why you, why you make a muscular ring here, is because when you blow it out, you're pulling up your diaphragm, and it's your diaphragm that you don't, you have no muscles in your lungs at all. It's the diaphragm that govern the, so if you pull the diaphragm up, when it drops, it sucks air into the lung. You don't have to suck it in, it'll just suck it in. As soon as you, as soon as you bring it right up, and you, you breathe in through your nose, it'll suck it right in, okay? Now the other thing is this, like, I sometimes give these lectures in a group of, in a community, and I'll go back night after night. The next night I go back after this lecture, and I ask him, how did you do with the deep breathing? And this one lady puts up her hand, and she says, I can't count to 20. And the man beside her has the presence of mind to turn her, and says, he said, go back to school. Well, what did she mean? I can't count to 20. Well, she couldn't count to 20. She couldn't, she breathe in, and then she couldn't get there, and she, pfft, you know, going to blow up. You want to slow your breathing down. You don't want to stop it. So when you count to 20, you count like you're playing hide and seek. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 19, 20. That's good. But count. I'll tell you why. Here's the reason. When you're problem solving, 
at 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning. Keep problem solving until you get anxious about going to sleep. Are you with me? Now, I want you to understand this is a very important principle. Keep your problem solving going as long as you're happy with it. The minute you start getting anxious about going back to sleep, make a promise to yourself. You're going to count. That's why you count. You count to 20 because you can't think about problems and count at the same time. You will not be able to do it. I guarantee it. I've tried it. You can't do it. You either do one or the other. Once you make yourself the promise that you're going to count, don't go back to problem solving. Are you with me? It's a decision. Now, I've had people tell me I did it 30 breaths and didn't go to sleep. What would you tell them? I'll tell them to just keep deep breathing because you will enjoy it. So I, I will, here's a recommendation. Go home and do it in the afternoon, tomorrow afternoon. Well, I'm going to have a lecture tomorrow afternoon, after the lecture tomorrow afternoon. Go home, lay on your bed, put a pillow under your knees, lay, with your, lay in a comfortable spot with fresh air coming in your room, and do 30 deep breaths yourself. I don't, I don't care if you go to sleep. I want you to do 30 deep breaths. I want you to feel like what it feels like. When I did it, and I felt oxygen in my body for the first time, my hands tingled, I felt my spine correct itself, it, muscles relaxed on my body, I didn't know... They just, I, I just went into total relaxation. Here's what I tell people. Deep breathe from the time that you stop your problem solving until 6 o'clock in the morning, and I guarantee you that you will be more relaxed than if you slept. And when you, when you find this out, you will wish that you could wake up so you could deep breathe because it's so much, so much more refreshing than sleep. Isn't that amazing? You will never, ever worry about going to sleep again. You will hope you can wake up so you don't go to sleep because deep breathing is that refreshing. All right? There's a very important principle. Deep breathing is one of the eight natural doctors, believe it or not. It's one of the ones that was, again, given by the prophet. Deep breathing is absolutely essential. Learn how to do it. Practice it. If you start deep breathing tonight, you'll, in six months' time, you'll be breathing deeper than you are tonight. And in a year's time, you'll be breathing deeper than you were in the first six months because it's an exercise and you get better at it and your relaxation becomes better as a result of it. Okay, so we got walking, we got deep breathing. What else can we do? What's one, what's one of the major problems with stress? What happens to the blood? Goes from the skin to the core. The core becomes congested. Are you with me? That's a problem. Until you get that blood away from the core, back out to the skin, you've still got stress. I can give you tablets, I can give you all kinds of things that make you feel like you don't have stress, but as long as your skin is cool and the blood is congesting your core, you're, as far as your body's concerned, you're still stressed. So we're going to show you what you can do this evening. We've got a young gentleman who's going to come up here and we're going to wrap him up in a cold, wet sheet and we're going to talk about it, okay? Just lay right here. Oh, no, just a minute. Wait a second. Oh. Whoa. Okay, so this is a, a called a wet sheet pack. And uh, oh, what's your name again, sir? Roderick, Roderick here is brave. Feel this, Rod. What does it feel like? What does it feel like? Cold. It feels cold. Okay, it's cold. You want it cold, all right? So we're going to put, we've got two blankets laying on the table here. And then we're going to wrap Roderick up in this cold wet sheet. Just lift this up for a second. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll take that. Okay, just lay on your back right here, your head up there.
You're allowed to scream if you want. Okay, just lift your head up a second. I'll get this out of the way. Okay, I'm going to put it down there just so I get this wrapped up around. Okay, there you go. Good. How's it feel? Cold? It feels comfortable? Okay. All right, let's go over what's going on here. So it's cold and wet. What's going to happen? The blood is congested in the core. And as soon as you put the cold, wet on the skin, what's going to happen? The blood is going to come from the core out to the skin. But it's not going to stay there because there's going to be too much there. So the body's going to say, it shouldn't be here. There's too much blood here. It's going to send it back to the core. But the, the, the sheet is still wet and cold. It's just going to bring it back out to the skin again. It's going to push it back to the core. It's going to put it out to the skin. What we're doing is we're rebuilding the relationship between the core and the skin. Are you saying, see what's going on? When you are sitting around with your friends and you're relaxed, your blood will flush, your skin will come out to the, uh, your blood will come out to the, sk the skin surface. That's what we're trying to do with him. When a person's got chronic stress, the blood is chronically congested in the core. And when you wrap them up in a cold, wet sheet, it can't stay there. It's got to come out to defend them against the cold. But then it has too much there, it sends it back, brings it back, and you get this Re reaction is what you're really after. 45 minutes to an hour wrapped up like that. I'll tell two, two stories. <clears throat> One lady came to us. She'd had three car accidents. None of them were her fault. She thought that she had on the back of her car, somebody had written, you know, with chalk, hit me. She'd walk around her car before she got in. She was absolutely terrified to get in her car. She was not only knocked around in the accidents, none of them were serious, serious accidents, but they were serious enough to damage the car and her. And it, it really damaged, she was 67, it damaged her self you know, worth or her self, you know, confidence in herself. Okay, she came to us. So I'm, I've got her laying on the table and I said, well, you know, her neck muscles are terribly stiff. I mean, not only from being thrown around, but just the stress. And so I just had her husband sit here and I told him, now well, here's what you got to do. You got to work the muscles where they insert into the skull. It's called the insertions. That's where the stress will build up. That's where the muscle gets to. You just have to do a light massage right there where the, where the muscles insert right into the back of the skull and it'll relax all the neck muscles, okay? So he went to touch her neck and she said, that's too rough. I said, he didn't touch you yet. She said, I don't care, it's too rough. So I said, well, that's not gonna work. So I said, what we need is a wet sheet pack. And so we had a lady wrapper up and she had three wet sheet packs one day after another. The third day, as she was walking out of the room, she said, I'm going to call my massage therapist. This is working for me. Three days, three days in a row. The first day with her, it wasn't going to work. It was going to take more than that. You see, what, what, it, what we're after here is we're after the circulation is, is actually congested in the core. That's, that's genuinely stress. When a person is really stressed over a long period of time, their circulation is unbalanced. The same author, the prophet, said, the better the circulation, the better the health. Perfect circulation is perfect health. When the core is congested, the person is under stress. Now, you could do this for yourself at home. You know how you do it? You lay the blankets out. You get the sheet. You get it really good and cold. Wring it out. Throw it in a pail. Go take a warm bath. Don't sweat. Just warm yourself up, but don't, take, don't get to the place where you sweat. Dry off, put your robe on, walk to your bed. Lay the wet sheet over top of the blankets. Sit down on it yourself. Now you're by yourself. Wrap yourself up with the wet sheet up to your waist. Then the blankets up to the waist. Roll back. Pull the sheet over you. Pull the blankets over you. and You, you can do it yourself. Lay in there for an hour. 
If you're under chronic stress, do it for at least three to four days in a row. And you'll what, look at your face every time you get out and you'll see what happens when stress disappears. You, you will see it yourself. I won't have to, you'll say, I, I can't believe it. It's gone. Whatever was, whatever, it, you're, you'll see the circulation on your eyes or on your lips. You'll see it change. I've never seen it fail. It will change. And that's the stress is lifted, right? Now, we had another lady came to us. She hadn't slept in two years properly. Horrendous stress in her home. And so I knew it, by then I'd worked there long enough at Silver Hills, I knew what she needed was a wet sheet pack. And so I wrapped her up. I didn't know, I said I had her wrapped up. I was standing in the hall, and when she was wrapped up in the wet sheet pack, I heard her let out a scream that I could hear in Lumbee, I'm sure. I was terrified, I mean, it just, I, just to hear that scream. And I knew that she needed it again, right? And I said, you know, please, you need another white sheet bag. Please don't scream like that. The guests will just leave, you know, the place will be empty. Please don't scream so loud. She said, it felt so good. I said, I don't care how it felt. Please don't do that. So I'm standing in the hall, and the lady wrapped her up, and again, she screamed as loud as you could hear it in Lumbee. I, I, I mean, I just did, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't have it done a third time. I just couldn't believe that we, it, somebody could scream that loud. Anyway, so we had two tubs downstairs, and we put her in hot and then cold. Submerged her in hot, and submerged her in cold, and then hot, and then cold. Three minutes of hot, 30 seconds of cold, three minutes of hot, 30 seconds, three times. She went upstairs and slept for seven hours, first time in two years. When she came down the next morning, there wasn't a lady in the place that recognized her, thought a new lady had come. I just couldn't believe it. I never poured the water again for her. She did it by herself. But what are we talking about? We're talking about some very simple things. We're talking about relieving stress. Stress is a real thing. It's not all in your head. It's in your physiology. Are you with me? It's actually your body as well. Treat the body, you'll treat the head. Are you with me? Treat the body, you'll treat... Dr. Kellogg took the wet sheet pack into all the psychiatric hospitals in upstate New York. And with the, he, he took the wet sheet pack into, the, into all the psychiatric hospitals in upstate New York, New York and replaced the, all of the then psychiatric drugs with the wet sheet pack. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, nowadays they have all kinds of medicines, but back in 1900, he used the wet sheet pack to get rid of all the anxiety, all that stress that was pent up in those people. All right? Okay, so we've given you three things. What are they? Walking, right? Deep breathing, right? Okay, and white sheet, wet sheet pack, okay? Okay, so you got those three things, all right? All right, let's take you through one more thing when we'll finish here. Oh, let me see where it is. There are some stresses that don't go away by any of these means. What can be done to handle them? It is not wise, it is definitely unhealthy to keep emotional tension bottled up. Instead, we should look for the most reasonable way to work it out. For some of us, talking over our problems fully and freely with a sympathetic friend advisor helps to clear the air. One of the things that my mother did when she was a little girl, she went to church seven days a week. Somebody will look at me, well, how, I, we don't have time. Well, okay, let me explain. She was in the Methodist church, and when she was said that she went to church seven days a week, it was not for religious services. They went one night and they, play, they did crafts. They went one night and they did girl guides. They went one night and they did singing. And they did one night and they did some hop, you know, sock hop or something like that. But what I'm saying is they had a community. They had friends. They talked to each other. They communicated with each other. There's a fellow that wrote a book called Bowling Alone. You know what? Bowling is fun. But alone? Can you imagine? I'm renting a, 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 an aisle tomorrow night by myself to go play bowling. Well, if I'm competing, maybe. But if I'm just bowling by myself, it's like, oh, I made a strike. Oh, I think I got it. You know, like, who's going to write it down? It doesn't matter, right? The reason why he called it Bowling Alone is he says, we, too many of us spend too much time alone. Get involved. If you're not involved in a church, get involved in, in, in the services in your community. Get involved in helping in your community. Get involved in volunteerism. Get involved with other people. Do not, you know, you wake up in the morning, you got a bump on your finger? You look at the bump and you go like, 
I didn't have a bump when I went to bed. What's wrong with my finger? And by, by breakfast, it's even bigger. You think, well, what's, I, I got a, a big bump. It's getting out of hand. So you phone a friend, and you talk to them about their kids and about their work and talking about everything. You don't say anything about the bump, and you ask them one, before you hang up, have you ever had a bump on your finger? Oh, yeah, I've had. When? Oh, a couple months ago, I had a bump. How long did it last? Oh, about two days. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. We talk to each other. You need to talk to other people. It's valuable, okay? Make friends, keep friends, be friends. All right, one last story. Here we go. 1983. Neighbor wanted us to build him a house. We wanted to build a guest house, but we didn't have any money. Neighbor wanted us to build him a house, so that's how you make money, right? You build houses, builders make money. It's supposed to. So we went to him, and he gave us the plans, and we sat down, and we went through every nail, screw, two-by-four, drywall, paint, lights, you name it, electrician, the whole thing, wrote it all down. We presented it to him. He liked the price. We both signed the plan. He signed the plan. We signed the plan. 1983. 1984, those of you who can remember back that far, we had galloping inflation. The day we started the project, every building material that we had placed was 33% higher. Every bit. Worse than what you're having right now. It was terrible. 33% higher. We were not going to make a cent on that house. That was our contingency was that 33%. You know what we did? We're working for free. Well, we worked for free at where we were at Silver Hills anyway. So this was just another, we worked for the neighbor for free now. The only thing is, is he took his fist like that and he shook it at every person that worked for him. Every person. He, he was a big man and he shook his fist and he threatened them. I had the guy that was putting on the siding quit. The guy that was building the cabinets was upset. Everybody that worked for him, I worked for him for a year and a half. And after a year and a half, I couldn't sleep. I didn't want to eat. I couldn't digest my food. And I wasn't able to have any memory at all. My memory was completely shot. I was in a wreck. I didn't know what to do about it. I was a total wreck. Depressed, suicidal, couldn't digest my food and couldn't sleep. Well, I was so bad that I had a prayer list. I wrote a prayer list because I, if I prayed, I, I would pray in circles. And so I wrote down a prayer list. I wrote down my wife's name, my son's name, my, children, my family's name. I prayed for each one of them. And I can remember one day looking across the room and thinking, you know what, I need to get a job. I need to get a new pair of work boots. And so I put on my prayer list work boots. You wouldn't do that. Nobody else here would do that, but I did it. Put work boots. Three weeks later, I went to town with my wife, and I said to her, you know, I got to go to the second-hand store and get another pair of work boots. I need about 25 bucks, 20 bucks could get me a pair of work boots. And she says, why don't you go to Workwear World? Well, because we, I haven't been working. I haven't made any money for a year and a half. We're broke. We don't have any money. I can't see myself. Well, I, I said, well, she's going to the bank. I'll go down to Workwear World. I figured if I did what she suggested, things would still work out better. So I went down to Workwear World. I looked at the boots. There they were. Kaufman's, double leather, triple stitch, $79.95. I can tell her it's impossible. We're not, we don't have that kind of money. And I saw on the wall a sign that said $9.95. I thought, well, they don't sell shirts in here for $9.95. I'm going to go see what it is. I walked over to the wall, and there they were. Kaufman's, double leather, triple stitch, $9.95. I said to myself, I said, I said to the lady, what's wrong with these boots? You can't sell this $80 boot for $9.95. And she says, oh, we bought a bunch of seven and a halfs. And she says, no workmen have seven and a half foot size feet. I gave her 20 bucks and she gave me change. And I was walking back to my wife. And now I got a smile on my face that was almost breaking it, right? And she says to me, what's wrong now? I just gave that lady 20 bucks and she gave me change for $20 and a brand new pair of boots. You know what was wrong with me? That lady didn't know that I had prayed for work boots and my wife didn't know I prayed for work boots. She didn't even know that it was written on my prayer list. But God did. And he just told me he loved me. 
And boy, oh boy, I needed that. I got to tell you, I needed that. I needed that so bad. And every time I pulled on those work boots, what do you think I thought? He loves me. And I need that. And we all need that. And that's ultimately where we're going to end up with stress, is when we find out that he loves us, right? Anyway, let's have a word of prayer to close this. Father in heaven, as we bow before you here this evening, you know the stresses we've been under this past two years. For some of us, it's affected our sleep, digestion. It's affected our well-being, Lord. It's affected our families. It's affected our homes, our children, our marriages. And boy, we sure need a pair of work boots. Well, maybe not work boots, Lord, but we need to have you close to us. We need to have you hear our prayers. We need to hear you, understand that you've heard our prayers and answering them. We pray for a blessing on each person in this church, on those attending the meeting this evening. We pray that you'll bless us with your presence and we may have a sense of it, that we may be able to have answers to prayer. Teach us the simple things, Lord, the things that, well, they're not great, but they really work, and we thank you in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. Pretty good now, eh? <laughs> now you don't want to get up. <laughs>